The histories of those days are lost to us, sad to say, for the kingdoms of the grass came and went in large measure before the race of man became literate. Only the legends persist. From such we know of the fisher queens, who ruled the lands adjoining the Silver Sea, the great inland sea at the heart of the grasslands, from a floating palace that made its way endlessly around its shores. Hey everyone, Crow Food's daughter here, and if you click this video, you have reached the Disputed Lands. I have been working on something concerning the Voice in the Flames to start out a new series on King's Blood, but sometimes my process takes longer than I would like. So because I haven't uploaded in a while, I have decided to bring you something different. So today, we will be discussing the grasslands of the Dothraki Sea, what it is, what it was, and speculate on what it possibly could have been, which may surprise you. Now let's get started. So, as we have learned from the World Book, there was at one point a great inland sea in Essos around the region of what is now known as the Dothraki Sea. This fabled Silver Sea is pretty interesting when you think about how the geography might have been thousands of years ago. Although this sea is described when mentioning legends, Maester Yandel contends that there is enough evidence to believe the past existence of this sea in the heart of where the grasslands now stand. Sufficient tales survive to convince most maesters of the past existence of the Silver Sea, though because of diminishing rainfall over the centuries, it has shrunk so severely that today only three great lakes remain where once its waters glistened in the sun. So, according to this passage, there are three great lakes that still survive to this day as the last remaining remnants of the once great inland sea. If we look at the official map of the Dothraki Sea from the lands of ice and fire, you will see the most likely candidates for these three great lakes are the two lakes by the kingdom of Sarnor in the womb of the world itself. And if this is indeed the case, if these are the same three lakes the maester is referring to, it would have made this fabled silver sea very, very large. However, I don't think we are realizing how big this sea might have really been at one time. Now, a little tidbit about myself. I grew up in Nebraska, in the heart of the Great Plains region of the United States. If you've ever driven through this region, it's a pretty boring drive. The area is really, really flat. Not much for trees or lakes, not much of anything really. In fact, when Lewis and Clark first explored and mapped this region, it was dubbed the Great American Desert because that is exactly what they thought they were seeing. Well, little did they know this area would one day become a fertile breadbasket as people would soon learn, the water is underground. As it turns out, the reason the Great Plains are void of trees and excruciatingly flat is because it was all once part of a great shallow inland sea called the Western Interior Seaway. In reality, there are only a few ways that our planet can create a plains region, and a giant sea just so happens to be one of them. This is a concept our author might even be trying to hint at with what appears to be a shrinking sea literally named the Shrinking Sea, located at the heart of the plains of the Jogos Nye. So every time I read about the Dothraki Sea, I can't help but think back to my fifth grade teacher telling me how the Great Plains were once a great inland sea. So when the World Book came out, and I read about this fabled Silver Sea that was once located at the heart of where the Dothraki Sea now stands, I was not surprised in the least. So who knows? Maybe the Silver Sea covered more of the Dothraki Sea than we realize. Maybe the Dothraki Sea was the Silver Sea. The Dothraki Sea, Sir Jor Mormont said, as he reigned to a halt beside her at the top of a ridge. Beneath them, the plain stretched out, immense and empty, a vast expanse that reached to the distant horizon and beyond. 
It was a sea, Danny thought. Past here, there were no hills, no mountains, no trees, nor cities, nor roads, only the endless grasses, the tall blades rippling like waves when the winds blew. That was Daenerys three of A Game of Thrones. Do you notice where the emphasis is placed with italics? Was. It was a sea. That is the author's intended emphasis, not mine. Check it out for yourself. Throughout the books, we see jokes, metaphor, and allusions to the Dothraki Sea being an actual sea. Maybe there is something there beyond imagery and humor. Maybe this is our author trying to tell us something. Five to ten thousand years might seem like a short period of time for a sea to dry of this magnitude, but in the real world, the Aral Sea has taken a mere sixty years to dry due to changes caused by damming and irrigation. The Dead Sea and many of the lakes of California are suffering a similar fate. So, in a fantasy world our author has created, it's possible this process could have been created by man or even catalyzed by some catastrophic event. Like say for instance the breaking of the world, the hammer of the waters, and the changing of the seasons from a regular pattern to an uncertain one where winters and summers will last an indeterminate period of years. So I know what you're thinking. What's the point? Why would this body of water be important? Well, you see, within the series, you might have noticed that our author has a tendency to play on the historical theory of mythology. This approach tends to view legends as being rooted in actual historical accounts that have been altered or exaggerated over time in the retelling. If you recall, legend tells us that the Fisher Queens ruled the lands adjoining the Silver Sea from a floating palace that made its way endlessly around its shores. Like many legends in A Song of Ice and Fire, these tales of Fisher Queens floating around in palaces may actually be a corruption of a more feasible reality that has been conflated over time. While the possibility exists, these palaces could be Dawn Age versions of Greywater Watch that's said to be the floating keep of House Reed. The most realistic explanation for these legends of floating palaces is most likely an early account of ships, meaning that the Fisher Queens of Legend were most likely a seafaring people. Within the world book, we also learn of the hero and Sarnori progenitor, Hugh Zoramai, a man said to have been born of the last of the Fisher Queens. As discussed in my video covering the Nissa Nissa Mono myth, we had discovered several variations of the Azorahai legend, which included stories such as Hugor of the Hill and Huko the Hero. In addition to these, the World Book also mentions another variation of a long night savior called Hirkun the Hero. So, by examination of the similarity and evolution of naming conventions, we see this Huzor Amai could very well be another version of the Azor Ahai monomyth. If you have been in the fandom for some time and have read the world book, you are probably familiar with the once great civilization from the Far East known as the Great Empire of the Dawn. There are several theories surrounding the civilization and many in the fandom consider the Great Empire to be the most likely civilization for the origins of not only Ashai, but also possibly that of Old Town, whose mysterious maze of fused stone serves as the base of the High Tower. If you are unfamiliar with the Great Empire of the Dawn, History of Westeros did an amazingly detailed collaboration with Lucifer Means Lightbringer on these subjects, which are linked in the description box below. Now, what you may not realize is that in the same chapter covering the Great Empire of the Dawn, we also find the Fisher Queens are conveniently speculated to have been contemporaries with this empire. At the Citadel of Old Town and other centers of learning in the West, maesters regard these tales of the Great Empire and its fall as legend, 
not history. Yet none doubt that the Yitish civilization is ancient, mayhap even contemporary with the realms of the Fisher Queens beside the Silver Sea. What we see is that suspicion has been inserted to raise the possibility both civilizations could have been living and functioning in Essos around the very same time. So not only do we see the author making connections to the Fisher Queens and an Azora High type hero named Hugh Zora Mai, but now, in addition to this, we also see connections being made with the Great Empire of the Dawn. In fact, if the Silver Sea was a massive body of water, this might prove useful in allowing travel throughout several portions of the continent, as the rivers of the present timeline might have served as inlets or passages to both the Shivering and Summer Seas, making interaction between various civilizations such as the Fisher Queens and the Great Empire of the Dawn possible. Knowing the significance this empire most likely played in the Dawn Age, it is quite possible this Silver Sea also had importance, knowing there is mention of a seafaring people and Old Town, an enemy from the sea and the mysterious civilization of Lorath, a seafaring people and the Iron Islands, a seafaring people and a shy, a seafaring people and, well, you get the idea. So who knows, maybe this fabled Silver Sea was much larger than we realize. If you like this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up, hit the subscribe button, and leave a comment down below. Thanks for watching!